Today on the podcast, we have Mel Robbins and uh, I've been gushing over her for probably like 20 minutes before we started because, uh, you know, I have a lot of people on the show that obviously I'm a big fan of, but Mel to me is next level uh, because of what she does. She is truly uh, a world-class transformational and inspirational expert. She's also, and for good reason, one of the most booked speakers in the world, right? Not even in, not even just women speakers, like in the world. Yeah. I almost never do women's events actually. Right. You do like, you do like Chase Bank and JP Morgan. Starbucks and, and Microsoft and yeah. Right. Like you, you kind of, there's, you transcend. It doesn't matter if you're female, male, whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I am very, very happy to have you at the, on this podcast because you always give such great advice, information, nu nuggets that of information that people can really implement and, you know, take in their lives and elevate themselves. So with that being said, thank you for uh, being wow, here. Wow. Well, thank you. And let me just say one thing about my comment that I don't really speak at women's events. Yeah. The reason why I said that specifically is because women speakers tend to get relegated as women speakers. Mm, yeah. And so it's really important if being in the media business or being in the speaking business or being kind of out there with your message is important to you. If you want to reach a broader audience, resist the tractor beam pull to be typecast as somebody who speaks to women just because you're a woman. I love that. Absolutely. And you know, what's funny. I, we had, uh, Chelsea Handler on a little bit ago and we were talking, we talked about that as well, how some people, but you know, that some people in her career also like it's, it's not a women comic. It's not this, you're the same type of situation, but there are people who do that. They go down a path or their content is very much women friendly. Great. If that's and what they want. Fantastic. Just be super intentional because eventually the world will align with what's ever in your heart and your mind. Right. But you're all, but also what you speak about applies to Everyone. everybody. It's not just women. It's not just male. And I agree with you because then you really kind of, you really, you kind of pigeonhole yourself and we don't, and as in a business, you don't want to be doing that. Unless you want to be doing it. You're very niche. So again, just be very clear about what you want. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really, again, we didn't even start really. You gave some great advice. Well, right I mean, there. from a business standpoint, I can't tell you how many times I've either sat down and thought, should I really just focus my business on women? Or how many times I've been in meetings with potential partners mm -hmm. that they've said, are you a women's brand? And I have thought about this very intentionally because we have a very, very large male following. And it's probably because I got my start with a TEDx mm -hmm. talk and then by being hired by corporations where the audiences are, you know, a mix of men and women. And I have come to really realize that uh, the things that I talk about are universal. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about habits. I'm talking about uh, mindset. I'm talking about fulfillment. I'm talking about your emotional needs as a human being. I'm talking about relationships and everybody needs to be working on and thinking about what they want in those areas of their life. And so everything I talk about, whether I'm explaining how to uh, quiet your anxiety, men have anxiety too. And so I have made a very conscious decision to resist being a brand that is only for women. Right. And you know what you just, but bec again, because like you said, these things are universal. Everybody has stress. Everybody has anxiety. It's not just for women or for men, but you just, you just said, let's go with that. Cause we, let's start with that. How do we quiet that anxiety? Because we all have it, especially, you know, in being in a pandemic or getting out of a pandemic or half and half people are really are having a hard time with all of that right yep. now. Yep. Um, and including you, me, everybody, what do you tell people or like, and this is what I was going to say also, what you give people is actionable. It's not just here, like la-di-da. There's things that, like I'm sure you're going to say right now, what people can actually do to implement, to help with their anxiety, suppress it a little bit, or just deal with it better. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, it's interesting that you say that because I, when I look at all the amazing people that are out there putting content out, writing books, doing shows, I tend to think about the fact that there are people that talk about why, mm -hmm. there are people that talk about what, and then there are people that talk about how, and I'm a how. And um, when it comes to anxiety, which is a really big topic, it's really important before you get to the how 
to actually understand what anxiety is and what anxiety isn't. And so if we can go down this road, I will be happy to unpack this topic because it's super, super important. So first thing is anxiety is nothing more than your body and your mind anticipating that something bad is about to happen. So there is a bracing in your body and there is a racing in your mind associated with what might happen, okay? I'm gonna give you an example that explains an anxiety response and that's normal, that everybody can relate to. And then we're gonna talk about what has become, in my opinion, an epidemic of generalized anxiety, mm -hmm. which is the experience of going through your day-to-day -day life, feeling on edge, like something's about to happen, so your nervous system is dysregulated, and your thoughts are always spinning several steps ahead of you. What if this, what if that, what if the other thing? So just normal anxiety, uh, I'll give you an example of an anxiety response to something. So let's say you and I uh, hop in your car and we drive to the grocery store and as we are chatting away and talking, all of a sudden somebody swerves into our lane. What do you do? I, I, I panic and I get anxiety, but I, I freak out or I try to move. Correct, apart. exactly. Yeah. That is a normal anxiety response to a very stressful thing, right. okay? The car's about to hit us, it hasn't hit us yet. So something bad's about to happen. And immediately your nervous system has a big wave of, oh my gosh, go through it. Mm -hmm. Anxiety response, okay? Mm -hmm. The anxiety response, it has a purpose. It is trying to wake you up to pay attention because something's about to happen. So that wave you feel of, oh my gosh, the car. That is got yeah. a purpose to protect you, okay? Your thoughts then start scrambling to try to protect you. It's going that way, I gotta pull this way. Like, so you start thinking about the what if that, what if that, and you, and you respond, right? Mm -hmm. Now here's an interesting thing. When the car veers off and we realize we're okay and life goes back to normal, what happens in your body? My, uh, my, I, I, I calm down and mm -hmm. I'm more at, I'm, I'm, I'm more normalized, yeah. I'm more, e more e equalized. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The threat goes away and so your body comes down. You switch from what's called the sympathetic, which is the fight or flight, oh. to the parasympathetic mm -hmm. nervous system, right? Right. And your thoughts don't spin anymore because you don't have, you're not anticipating that threat. Right. That is normal anxiety. It's an alarm system right. that makes you pay attention. The problem is we have been so bombarded by negative news, by uncertainty, by the pandemic, by the changes to our day-to-day -day life, by the uh, racial injustice that we see on the television playing out, by political polarization, by the isolation, it's too fucking much. Yeah. And so what's happened is we have all gotten ourselves in a situation due to the way that life is right now, where you feel like you're about to be hit by a car all the time. <laughs> there is a nervous system on edge. That's a, what we call a dysregulated nervous system. And your thoughts are constantly scrambling. Like, let's take it. Let's take this moment right now. I personally thought we'd be through the pandemic by now. Yeah, I think most people did. <laughs> and we are now in sort of the, we're 18 months in. I thought the kids would be going back to school. I thought we'd be over the masks. I thought uh, we'd be back to doing big events. I thought that not that they, that we have to go back to normal because there's a lot about the old normal mm -hmm. that I don't want to go back to, but I kind of feel like you know this this experience of I was in a great relationship, we broke up, I got my heart broken, I worked hard to get through it and get over it, I finally felt like I was okay again, and now he's back and my life is screwed up again because now I'm head over heels and then he dumps me yeah. again and now I'm back <laughs> trying to get over it again, you know, like I thought yes. there's an exhaustion to it, mm -hmm. and so. I'm explaining this in detail because it's not as simple as change your thoughts. It begins with policing your thoughts because your mind and your nervous system are hardwired together. And so there are two different ways you got to attack anxiety. You got to attack both the way it makes your nervous system go like this, mm -hmm. because we know based on research, if your nervous system is on edge, your prefrontal cortex doesn't function. Right. I mean, if somebody were to walk in here and with a gun and try to rob us, would you be able to do a math problem? 
I, I don't think so. Yeah, of yeah. course not. Yeah. Because your nervous system is like, oh my God, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. So this part of the brain shuts off. So let's talk first, what can you do to settle your body? Okay. We I write about this extensively in this new book. This, this. Oh, right. The, the, your new book is called the high five. Again, that's why the high five habit, um, which is, um, it's a really good book. You do talk about this a lot. You talk about how we can conquer our negative thoughts our stress. I'm going to ask you about the 20 gallons of hot water pretty soon, but yeah. finish this. And so, then so basically, um, you can use something called the vagus nerve and a mm -hmm. tool that I like to talk about is called high five in your heart. So you put your hands right here right like in the center of your chest over your heart and you say these three words you say i'm okay i'm safe i'm loved <sighs> i'm okay i'm safe i'm loved and when you put your hands here you are toning and activating what's called the vagus nerve the vagus nerve mm -hmm. runs all the way from your seat to the top of your head through every major organ through your vocal cords and it is the key it's the switch between your fight or flight state of anxiety and your calm state. And so first things first, you wanna develop a practice first in the morning, not only of high-fiving yourself in the mirror, which we're gonna to get to, which is all about self-confidence and self-esteem and self-love and self-worth, but you're also gonna wake up every morning, put your hands right here and go, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. And you're gonna say it as many times as you have to, 113, 11 times, two times, until you actually feel your body settle down. And you will, you will feel yourself ground back into your body you will feel something shift. And if you can hear yourself saying those words, I'm okay, I'm sorry if I'm loved, it's true in that moment. And by putting your hands right here, this is what activates the vagus nerve. Other things that help you tone the vagus nerve, an ice bath, a hot shower, a hot bath, singing, gurgling, humming, chanting, because it stimulates mm -hmm. your vocal cords. And so this is a little tool you can use. I love doing it first thing in the morning, but you can use it anytime you feel anxious to settle yourself back in your body. Today, we're gonna to talk about the biggest fear that people have in life. You know, Seinfeld famously joked that um, the person in the coffin isn't scared. It's the person who has to speak about the person in the coffin who is. The fear of public speaking is the number one fear that people have. And I don't even mean necessarily talking on a stage like I do for a living. I'm talking about the fear of speaking in public, sharing your ideas at work, expressing what you need to other people, having hard conversations with friends and family, talking at a meeting at school, uh, pushing back on something uh, with a doctor, like just being able to express yourself. And the reason why this is such a huge fear for people is because... It is a moment of intense vulnerability. The second that you go to speak at work, what happens? Everybody turns and all eyes are on you. And suddenly you feel like there's a spotlight on you and you get really worried about being judged. Uh, same thing happens when you have to speak in class, right? When you got called on in class, whoop, most people get a little nervous. A lot of people hated that moment in elementary school when you had to read out loud. That's a moment of public speaking. And we are so afraid in that moment when the spotlight is on us. And I've shared in a number of episodes that I used to be terrified of public speaking. I would turn bright red when I got called on as a little kid. Uh, in law school, I would start coughing attacks or I would leave the room. Uh, as a young uh, lawyer, I would wear a scarf because I'd get these neck rashes as I was talking to the judge and to the prosecutor in a small uh, courtroom. And I just figured I would be the kind of person that always had a bright red face, always had an awful case of hives on my chest, always felt my tongue going dry. And I hated it. I hated it, hated it, hated it. And today what I'm going to talk about is how I went from being afraid of public speaking to becoming I, I, I'm almost like, you know, like I, 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 it sounds braggadocious, but the truth is I went from that to being the most successful female speaker in the world. More than 111 speeches a year um, on the corporate circuit. So Microsoft, Starbucks, JP Morgan, AT&T, any kind of company you can imagine. I've been there. Now, the first question I always get is, how did you get into the speaking business and how did you become the most sought after female speaker on the corporate speaking circuit, Mel? Well, the truth is, I didn't set out to do anything. 
I've told you guys a story about how that TEDx talk happened by accident in 2011 and how I had a 21 minute long panic attack while I was giving that talk. And I never thought I would speak ever, ever, ever again. And then something crazy happened. A year later, somebody put the TEDx talk online and for another year, it went crazy viral. And I didn't even know it was online. And so we're talking 2013. Now, by mid-2013, people start to reach out to me on Facebook and say, hey, I saw that thing in San Francisco. And I'm like, were you there? They're like, no, it's online. I'm like, it's online? And I realized, holy cow, this thing's online. It's got like a million views. That's crazy. And people kept reaching out. And it was mainly women's conferences. And they were asking if I wanted to come and do like a breakout session. And they wanted me to just repeat that TEDx talk. And so I had no idea that this was an industry or a business. I looked at speaking as something that famous people do, something that sports people do, something that people that are major, major authors must do. So I didn't have a book. I didn't have anything. I just had my little secret five-second rule in my back pocket. I had a TEDx talk that had mistakenly gone viral online, and now I had people asking me if I would come and I would talk. Uh, in breakout sessions at women's conferences. And I'm like, okay, that sounds fun. Now, keep in mind in my life, uh, this is the moment when Chris has left the restaurant industry. He is bottomed out, not functioning, focused on getting sober. And I am working two jobs trying to keep things afloat. I mean, it is a really scrambling time in our life. And so I said yes to these things. And I'll never forget it. In 2013, I did seven talks, I think it was, all for free. I had no idea that people got paid to do this. And um, I was doing it because I wanted to escape <laughs> the pressure of my life. And if I'm being perfectly honest, as nervous as I was that about doing this, and I'd get a big neck rash, and I'd turn bright red in my face, as nervous as I was... There was something about being asked to tell my story and inspire other people that really lifted me up and made me feel, I don't know, like it's sort of like how you fluff a pillow up when it's looking deflated. It just lifted my spirits a little bit to, to have the focus be on helping other people. And so it was like a lifeline. But I was still so nervous when I tell you I was nervous, I mean, I was so nervous. I not only wore Spanx, I would put like a pad in the Spanx because I was sweating so much. I had all kinds of wardrobe fails because I would, I would literally sweat like Niagara Falls. I, that's what I do. I have a hot flash as I get nervous. So um, I'll never forget it. It was um, the Pennsylvania Women's Conference. It was Hillary Clinton, I think, was the keynote speaker. And uh, then there was this incredible woman who was the principal of Strawberry Hill Mansion, who um, I just love. And she spoke in the main room, 14,000 women there. And I was in this breakout session. And it was the largest room I had ever been in. I almost had a heart attack. There were like a thousand seats set up. And I had never been in a room that size. So I give this talk, which was largely just a mimic of the, the, the TEDx talk that I did. And... This woman comes up to me afterwards and she's like, oh, my God, you were so great, you know, which was really nice to hear. And she said, can I ask you a question? You know, I, I was also a speaker this morning. I was in a breakout room on a panel and I just want to ask you a question, speaker to speaker. And I was like, of course. And she said, did you get your check yet? And I said, check. Wait a minute. You, you got paid for this? And she looked at me with horror. And said, oh, my God, I'm really sorry. I just assumed, like, you had a bigger... I just assumed that you got paid. I'm like, people get paid for this? Like, people, like, normal people get paid for this? And I was so flabbergasted. It was one of those moments where you're just like, am I the stupidest fucking idiot on the planet? Does everybody else know this shit but me? And I was so dumbfounded that for two weeks, I was just, like, stunned at what an idiot I was. I didn't even think to ask anybody to pay me to do this. Because I didn't think I was any good at it. So um, I made myself a promise. I said, you know what? I have no idea what to charge. You don't have a book. You should probably write one of those too. But um, first got to figure out how to keep the lights on in the house and uh, keep the family afloat and keep paying the bills. And I thought, here's what I'm going to do. 
I am going to just, when the next person calls and says, we'd like to book you to speak, I'm going to pause, five, four, three, two, one, take a breath, and then I'm going to say, I think I'm available. What's your budget? And then I'm going to wait. I'm going to listen to the number, and then I'm going to go, five, four, three, two, one, pause. Normally, I'm double. And pause and see what happens. Because I, I didn't even know what to price myself at. So two weeks later, the phone rings, and it's this guy in Dallas, Darren Paul, and he had been in the speaking business for like 20 years, and he says, you know, blah, 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 heard the da, 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 and I got to thank his wife, Lori, because she's the one that saw my TEDx talk going viral on Facebook, and she said to her husband, you got to book this woman for our sales conference for Jay Hilburn. And so Darren calls me, first phone call I received, no joke, when I've made myself this promise. And... He asks if I'm available five months from now in Dallas in August to speak at the National Sales Conference for this company, Jay Hilburn. I said, I think I'm available. What's your budget? And he said, $10,000. I dropped the fucking phone. We had liens on our $10,000. I, 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 I had no fucking idea, people. What the fuck? $10,000 fucking dollars? Are you fucking kidding me? I will, I will literally, I'll strip for that. I mean, that's unbelievable. So I, I forgot the second part. I was like, okay, I'm in. I'm in. Yes, yes, yes. Now, luckily I was so nervous. And, you know, sometimes fear is a fantastic thing because it motivates you. I was so nervous because I felt so unworthy of that amount of money that I did something really smart. And fear motivated me to do this. I was so nervous that I would fall flat on my face because I believed I was not worthy of that kind of money because I had never made that kind of money. That I used half of the budget to pay a graphic designer to help me create a PowerPoint because I needed at least something that would look like that. And I practiced and I practiced and I prepared. And that's one of the big things that you got to take away. One of the best freaking tools for nerves is preparation. The more you prepare, what you're actually doing is working through your own resistance to this shit. You're creating muscle memory. You're rehearsing. Will you choke? Maybe, but not after I teach you the tools that I'm going to teach you today, but you will never get better or conquer your fear of doing this, public speaking, if you're unwilling to prepare. So part of the nerves might be that you're not even preparing enough. You're not rehearsing. You're not rehearsing in front of people. You're not taking the time to edit your mark. Like it takes time and rehearsal is so important. If you prepare, you're removing nerves. You're setting yourself up to win. And so think about preparing like you're just building this muscle. It doesn't take the nerves away or the fear away or the stakes away. But by God, it's going to help these tools work because you will have the preparation. There's this really famous quote that I love. Uh, that I talk about all the time. It's by Charlie Bird Parker. I don't even know if this is a real story, but I love this quote. Apparently, Charlie Bird Parker, the famous jazz musician, was asked by a journalist who was writing a big article about him. How the hell do you do what you do with that horn? And you know what Charlie Bird Parker said? He said, well, first you got to learn your instrument. And that takes years decades of practice you got to study it you got to rehearse you got to do your scales you got to practice over and over and over and over and over again until you learn that instrument and then you forget all that shit they taught you and you just wail and so preparation allows you to tap into your genius preparation is what allows you to improv, to freestyle, to be fully express the highest you, to channel, to like tap into something. And it's in there in you. That's why you feel this push-pull and this desire to show up more in your life. So I spent all this time preparing and I showed up and there are moments in your life that really matter. And this was one of them. I met this moment. I stepped on that stage with my neck rash and my rosy cheeks and my dry mouth 
and I fucking destroyed it because I had prepared because I was afraid. Now, I also had the biggest wardrobe failure I have ever had on a stage. So I wore this dress because at the time I was a commentator for CNN and I used to wear this dress all the time on CNN. And I thought, okay, if somebody's paying you that kind of money, you got to look like you're on TV. So I wore this like kind of power lady dress. You can already imagine it, right? It's got like sort of the the V-neck and the pencil skirt and it's hard to walk in. It looks good on television, but you're not moving and you're sitting in a chair. I had never looked at it with a light behind me. And at the end of the speech, I just fillet this thing. I walk off that stage. It was the first time I'd ever been projected on a jumbotron in an arena. And after the speech, this woman came up to me. She was darling. She's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I love the five-second rule. Thank you so much for those. It was amazing. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm going to pay my mortgage this month. This is great. And she said, you were so great. I have to tell you something. And I'm like, what? She said, don't ever wear that dress again. I said, why? She said, I don't even want to tell you this. I said, what? She said, I could not only see that you were wearing Spanx, but that you had a thong on underneath them. That dress is so th- see-through, and you could see it all on the Jumbotron. Okay. We went from winning to wanting to melt and crawl into a hole, but fuck it. You know, I honestly, when you fuck up, you know what? The research shows people like you more, and that shows in that comment. That, by the way, is called the pratfall effect, that your imperfections make you more likable, more trustworthy. It makes you as an expert be somebody that people lean toward. And you've had this experience, haven't you, where you might have somebody that's got a PhD that's a know-it-all that's really snooty and talking down to you. You're kind of like, I don't want to learn from you. But when you got somebody that is, you know, on a stage or teaching you something or just somebody you meet, if there's something that humanizes them, it so builds trust. And that's an important thing to understand because the idea here is not that you're going to get it perfect. It's that you're willing to try. So maybe that's why I destroyed it. I don't know. Everyone was rooting for me because you could see the Spanx and the thong underneath the dress. But that dress went in the freaking trash can at the hotel, never to see the light of day again, although I hope somebody pulled it out and used it. Um, But I never looked back from that moment because Darren, who booked me, had been in this business for 20 years, and he said, I got to tell you, you are top three of all time and the single best female speaker I have ever seen in my entire life who manages your business. And I said, you do. And he has run my speaking business ever since. And so along the way, it took me several years to truly get over my nerves. And I don't get nervous. I care deeply. I get super intentional um, about the stakes because I really want to make a huge difference and I want to destroy it on these stages and entertain and empower and inspire and all of it. So I do care about how I perform when um, I am stepping on a stage or I'm behind this mic. But I have come up with incredible ways to not only face my fear of public speaking, but to conquer it and to use science and really amazing mental reframes to tame those nerves. And that's what I'm going to teach you today. Because you know what I want for you? I want your fullest expression. I want fear to stop holding you back. I want you to trust fall into your life. I want you to take that first step and climb the staircase to the things that you want in your life. And there are too many places where fear holds you back and keeps you silent and has you questioning yourself. And so that was me too. And I just chipped away at this fucker. And I am so glad that I did because I just can't even imagine how much I would yearn for what I'm doing now without even realizing it. But the first step is admitting that there are fears that are holding you back. And so we're going to use public speaking because it's the number one fear for everybody. Now I'm going to teach you a little trick. When you say I'm excited, your brain tells your body you're safe. And so they studied this at Harvard Medical School. If you, in a moment like this, go five, four, three, two, one to interrupt the racing, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then you say, I'm so excited to be up here. 
I'm really excited, even though I'm, I'm like shaking. I'm really excited because my colleagues believe in me. I'm really excited and I'm really proud of myself. Something is gonna happen in your body, so I want you to repeat that with me, okay? You ready? I'm really excited to be up here. I'm really excited to be up here. Let's do it a little louder. I'm really excited to be up here. I'm really proud of myself. I'm really proud of myself. I'm really excited that my colleagues love me so much. I'm really excited that my colleagues love me so much. And I'm really excited I'm pushing through my fears. I'm really excited I'm pushing through my fears. Do you feel your body settling a little? Even just a little? No. No? Not at all? I don't believe you. I think that you think if you say, I actually feel a little bit better, Mel, that I'm gonna make you stay up here longer. Isn't that, see? I knew it! I knew it! How many of you feel for her and you know fear is holding you back too? Fear lowers when you move. I wanna hear you say, I'm excited I'm up here because I know Deep down in your heart, you are. I'm excited to be up here. Why are you proud of yourself for allowing yourself to come up here? Because I'm awesome. Yes! Yes! Yes, you are! You are! Yes, you are! Come on! Get up for her! Get out of your seat, Sam! I want you to take this in. Take this in. You are awesome. What did you get out of this, other than hating Mel Robbins? <laughs> I'm gonna get my boss. <laughs> She deserves a promotion. I want to raise on Monday morning. That's 10. Huh? What did you get out of this? Um, it's not so bad to be seen. Oh, man. That's deep. That's deep. It's a beautiful thing to allow yourself to be seen. And too many of us, because of whatever's happened to you, whatever you've survived, because it scares the hell out of you, we won't even allow ourselves to be seen. It makes me so sad. It really does. And so I hope that in your bones and your nerves and your cells, this is a line in the sand, a before and an after. And when you catch yourself opting out or hiding, that you remember this moment and you choose to be seen and to show up for yourself because you are freaking awesome. <laughs> they see the women at that table that pointed at you and pointed at you they see what you see. You are awesome. All right, so Cameron, I'm really excited. I'm gonna teach you how to create and use what I call a confidence anchor. Not only when you're about to fly and you're nervous, but for any single situation where you're nervous to do something, okay? Are you ready? Yep. Awesome, it's super cool. And for you listening, I want you to just hold that situation that you're nervous about. So maybe you're nervous to give a presentation at work, or maybe you have a son or a daughter who is getting recruited for a sport, and now there's all these big team matches coming up, and they're starting to get nervous. This confidence anchor is exactly what you need. So step number one is you're going to think about this situation that makes you nervous, okay? And we've already talked about that, Cameron. It's this flight to Portugal. Step number two is come up with something about this situation that actually makes you excited. So describe for me, Cameron, what are you excited to do when you get to Portugal? I think the 
thing that I'm most excited for is to see my sister. I haven't seen her in a couple months. She's been in London. So I don't know. I, when it, when I think about Portugal, there's a lot of things I'm excited for, but probably the biggest thing is just to spend time with her. And yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. So you now have something related to the situation that makes you nervous that you're actually excited about, okay? Now, Mm -hmm. number three is the most important part. Number three is now that you have something that you're excited about, I want you to close your eyes and we're going to bring it to life. I want you to imagine the moment that you lay eyes on your sister for the first time in several months. And I'm imagining, are you imagining the airport or a cobblestone street? Like what is the scene? Describe with your eyes closed. What is she wearing? What happens? Mm -hmm. Describe it for us. Well, first of all, she's probably, I don't know. She's probably mad that we're late about something. But uh, (laughs) when I think about it, we're, yeah, we're in probably like Lisbon where we're going to land and probably right outside, you know, the first glance of a new city, something that is always really exciting when you leave an airport. I think that's the best part about flying is getting to somewhere you're, you know, anticipating seeing. Um, So I picture that. I picture her standing there probably like in some black sweater because that's usually what she's wearing. And yeah, her, I think seeing her face reacting to my mom me and my brother that's going to be like the best part because I know she even if she won't admit it she does miss us a lot so awesome and who is she gonna hug first a hundred percent my mom okay awesome and how I'll probably be last (laughs) and as you stand there and watch her in her black sweater with Lisbon in the background hugging your mom what are Uh you feeling like a sense of comfort a sense of wholeness and yeah, just a really good feeling to have us all together during like a really hard time of the year. It's going to, it's going to be really special. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's your confidence anchor. That moment that you just described in detail, the black sweater, Lisbon in the background, her reaction as she sees you, her hugging your mother first, the wholeness, the comfort, all of that that you just felt in your body, that is your confidence anchor. Now, here's how you're going to use it. From now until that moment happens, the millisecond that you feel any nerves or any fear or any negative thought come up related to this thought, you're gonna Mm -hmm. close your eyes. You can use my five second rule to interrupt the worries. Just count backwards with me. Five, four, Four, three, three, two, two. one. (laughs) Yep. That is a starting ritual that will signal to your brain that you're not gonna think about a plane crash you are starting to think about something else. And then you are going Mm -hmm. to bring to the forefront of your mind that image, that feeling that you just described. And that is how you drop a confidence anchor on these bullshit nerves and worries that have been hijacking your life. That's what a confidence anchor is. You're using your own excitement about something that normally makes you nervous to shatter the grip that fear and nerves has on your body and your mind. That's what you're going to do. And when you head to the airport on the way to the plane, you are going to use this same confidence anchor. And when you get on that plane and your thoughts go, "Uh uh-oh, you're going to go, nope. Five, four, three, two, one, and you're going to drop that confidence anchor. And when you take off in the middle of the night 
And the pilot says, we might experience a little bit of turbulence, because pilots often say that. You're going to drop that confidence anchor. And you're going to come back over and over and over again to this image of your sister and the black sweater and Lisbon behind her and her hugging your mother. That's exactly what you're going to do. And you're going to be shocked because this is a technique that they studied at Harvard Business School called reframing performance anxiety was the name of the study, reframing performance anxiety. And it's a way to flip moments that make you nervous into moments that make you excited and to keep control of your mind, body, and spirit so that your fears don't hijack and torture you. Wow. (laughs) What do you think? I mean, it makes sense because... I think in the moments of panic, the last thing I'm doing is thinking about anything that brings me happiness. It's always the darkest feelings, the heaviest emotions versus, you know, even just closing my eyes just now. I feel so different, like sitting here. I feel like even thinking about that moment makes me happy. And I'm excited to use it because I know I'm going to be anxious all next week, week after. So you want to know why this works? I do. Okay. Seems too good to be true. Honestly, it seems too good to be true. Well, the reason why it works is because it taps into your body's automatic systems. If you look into the neuroscience on this, scientists call this an autonomic response that basically your nervous system has a autonomic response to stressful situations. Okay. That like, if you're a normal person like me, you just say, oh yeah, we, if we're in a stressful situation, we automatically feel all kinds of things. Right. And so what I want Mm -hmm. you to understand is that, you know, when we're in situations that make us nervous, everybody, whether you're giving a speech or you're going into an interview or you're on a first date or you're running a track meet or you're getting on a plane or you're breaking up with somebody or you're going in for a job interview, it is going to be automatic that your nerves take over because you're about to do something that makes you stressed out a little bit. It's requiring you to feel, it makes you feel a little bit vulnerable. But here's the cool thing. Even though you have this automatic response, because you're right, there's no way over the next five weeks you're not going to feel anxious because that's the autonomic response that your body has to this stressful thing. But here's the cool thing, Cameron, you can control this. So here's, here's the secret. The secret is understanding that your body's reactions to fear, so your automatic reaction to a fearful situation, is the exact same as your body's automatic response to an exciting situation. And we're going to use this truth that your body's automatic reaction to fear is the same as your body's automatic reaction to excitement to your advantage. So tell me about a situation that makes you excited, like just something like in your day-to-day life, okay? Give me a situation that makes you excited. In my day-to-day life, that makes me excited. Oh, well, how about this? Who's your favorite musician? Uh, I really like the Lumineers. Okay, great. Guess what? Mm-hmm. The Lumineers are playing a private concert at the new private venue at the Fenway Park. You, my friend, not only have front row seats, you're going to meet them before the show. Okay. It's five weeks out. How do you feel? Jittery a little bit. Um like kind of the same feeling I would have if I, you know, was playing a big soccer game or running an important race uh-huh. when I was younger, like the clammy hands, the pit in your stomach. Yep. The Dude, like, we're walking into this venue. You're walking up yeah, to the front like, row. How you feeling? My heart's beating fast. I'm like going a million miles an hour. I don't know. Probably feeling like really on edge. Yeah, the usher is coming up to be like, okay, they're ready to meet you. How are you feeling? (laughs) I'd be like, okay, okay. Like, let me collect myself. (laughs) Yeah, probably really flustered and uh, I don't know, like a little bit anxious probably. So it kind of sounds like a situation like that where you're about to meet your favorite band which I would say, is that a positive or a negative experience? Yeah, that'd be amazing. I mean, 
a positive one, obviously. Well, it sounds very similar to the way that you experience the thought of flying to Portugal. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's true. Yeah, you want to know the only difference? When you're in the situation that's positive, that makes you excited, and you're about to meet the Lumineers, your mm -hmm. brain is telling you you're excited. Your brain is telling you the jitters in your stomach are butterflies. And that's a good thing. Your brain is telling you your hands are clammy and your heart is racing because something good's about to happen. The only difference between that and what you experience as you think about flying to Portugal is what your brain is saying about the flight. When you start to experience butterflies in your stomach as you are about to board the flight, your brain's going, uh-oh, there's something wrong. This is negative. I'm going to, the plane's going to crash. You're experiencing in your body, Cameron, the exact same physical and physiological symptoms when you meet the Lumineers as when you board a plane. And the only difference is what your brain is saying about it. And so the reason why a confidence anchor works is we are going to shut your negative brain down and drop this confidence anchor right on it like a sledgehammer. And we're going to replace <laughs> your narrative that something's wrong with, holy shit, I'm about to see my sister. This is so exciting. It's as exciting as meeting the Lumineers. And when your brain starts <laughs> to say the butterflies are positive, you won't escalate yeah. into a panic attack. You will have taken control. How cool is that? That's pretty cool. So do you have any questions about the confidence anchor and how you're going to use it? It just honestly seems still a little bit too good to be true. Like, I don't know. I can just conquer all my fears just by flipping the way I'm thinking. There's a scientific reason why this works. So they researched this at Harvard Business School. And what they did is they put people in control groups and put them in situations that made them nervous. So they put uh, one group into a control group where they had to run a track meet. Another one had to sing karaoke. Another one was in like a debating competition. And they taught one group of people to use this reframing tool where you think about something related to the track meet or the debating competition or karaoke that you're excited about. And so this group was taught to say, I'm excited. I'm excited to run this meet. I'm excited to get up there on the stage and conquer my fears. I'm excited to, to go and debate because I've prepared. The people who use this simple reframing tool outperformed the people who didn't. They felt less nervous and there's a scientific reason why. Earlier, we talked about the fact that there are these auto, automatic responses that our body has to situations that are exciting or stressful. And in our case, Cameron, we talked about the Lumineers and how that's exciting, meeting the Lumineers, and getting on a plane to Portugal, which used to make you nervous. Just talking about those two situations created an automatic response in your body, didn't it? Yep. Yep. That automatic response is nothing more than a series of chemicals firing and messages firing between your brain and your nervous system. The reason why you and I get butterflies is because when the brain sends a message down to your nervous system that, holy cow, we got to get on a plane, or holy cow, the Lumineers are about to walk in, your mm -hmm. nervous system goes, oh, got it, and immediately starts changing up the chemicals in your body. Adrenaline fires. The blood races to your head and to your heart. That's why your heart starts pounding. That's why your thoughts start to race. Now you get butterflies because the signal in your brain going to your gut just changed the chemicals in your digestive tract. That's why we all get butterflies. That's it. And so in the situation with the Lumineers, you flipped your thoughts. I'm excited to meet them. And so that explains all the reasons why you have all of these changes going on in your body, why your heart is racing, why your butterflies are in your stomach. This automatic response doesn't scare you because you're thinking positive thoughts when it comes to the Lumineers. Now, when you get on the mm -hmm. plane and your brain signals to your stomach that something's up and your heart starts to race because the blood goes to your heart, and the butterflies start to flutter in your stomach because the chemical structure just changed in your digestive tract, 
If you have negative thoughts about the plane, a couple things happen. You start to get scared of the automatic response in your body. And more cortisol starts to flood your brain, which is the stress hormone. And once that happens, what they found at the Harvard Business School study is that the cortisol interferes with your brain's ability to do whatever you had prepared to do. This is why most of us, when we stand on a stage, go blank. It's because we have an automatic response. Our brain goes, oh shit. We get scared of our racing heart because we think it means that the plane's about to crash or about to screw something up. The cortisol floods our brain and we forget what we prepared. When the cortisol floods your brain, you forget about seeing your sister. You forget about all the exciting things. You forget about all the research that you did that shows that traveling by commercial airplane is the safest way to travel, period. Mm -hmm. That's why this matters. And it's more than just thinking positive thoughts. It's critical that you come up with the thing you're excited about before you get into the situation. Because once your thoughts start to race and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to screw up this test or oh my God, I'm going to screw up this interview or oh no, the plane, you've already lost control. You have to come up with this exciting anchor and this confidence anchor before you start to get nervous. Got it? Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> it just makes so much sense. You know, I always have taken the approach of calm down cam, like, you know, kind of making myself to be the bad guy. Um, and not really reframing it in any way, just letting myself kind of soak in all the stress and anxiety, <laughs> uh, and just kind of reprimand myself being like, what the heck, you know, why are you, why are you not just calming down? Like there's a six year old that's, you know, bouncing around and it's like, oh, I love when the plane goes up and down. And it's like, why can't I be like that six-year-old? But uh, let me yeah, tell you why. I think this I is get... excellent, Cameron. Let me tell you why you can't play <laughs> okay. by that six-year-old because I love this analogy. The six-year-old's brain is not attaching negative thoughts to the plane bouncing up and down. As far mm -hmm. as the six-year-old is concerned, this is exciting. That's why they're not panicking. And so yeah. the reason why in the history of telling yourself to calm down, you have never been able to calm down is because you are dealing with an automatic response in your body. So let's go back to the science. When you get into a situation that makes you nervous or that makes you stressed out or makes you afraid or that makes you excited, those are states in your body of high agitation. Those are states of alertness. Those are states when your blood starts pumping and your brain starts paying attention and, you know, everything kind of aligns because you're about to do something that makes you excited or fun or nervous or afraid. And so you go into a state of being hyper alert. That state of high agitation is one that you can't calm down like that. So what we're doing when we teach you to create a confidence anchor and to use excitement to reframe what you're feeling is we're taking a state of high, ag high agitation from the negative to a state of high agitation in the positive. We're actually using the automatic response in our body to, the, to our advantage. And we're just tricking our brain to believe that we're actually excited because our brain doesn't know the difference. Your brain is like the six-year-old. Your brain actually doesn't know the difference between excitement and fear. That baby that's bouncing is feeling the heart racing and then the, the bubbles in her stomach. It's just that your brain is framing it in the negative. Because your brain knows that excitement and that fear feels the same, that lumineers, that meeting the lumineers and being on an airplane feels the same. You can use that to your advantage and trick your brain in a moment where you would normally be nervous to actually think you're excited. And the reason why this matters, Cameron, is because when you're on that plane, 
If you can come back over and over and over to your confidence anchor, and if you can close your eyes in a moment of turbulence, and you can imagine your sister, and you can start to say out loud, and this is important, you've got to say to yourself, I'm so excited to see, what's your sister's name? Sienna. I am so excited to see Sienna. I'm so excited to see Sienna. I cannot wait for Sienna to hug my mom. I cannot wait for this. If you come back to that confidence anchor, you are going to flip your brain into believing that you're excited about that moment and you will no longer be afraid. And it's a way to gain control. And you know what? You want to know something really cool? Because your confidence anchor is related to what you're doing, it's really believable. Mm -hmm. Because when you are there hugging your sister, it means the plane made it and there's nothing to be worried yeah. about. That's why this works. When you imagine before a test yourself walking out of there going, yes, it actually makes you excited to take it. When you imagine yourself nailing the interview, it makes you excited to walk into it because your brain doesn't know the difference between a state a fear or a state of excitement. And now you know a simple trick backed by research from Harvard to take control of your mind and take control in situations where nerves normally derail you. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that was always like in the back of my head during our conversation was if I'm still I feel fear in a lot of different areas of my life, not mm -hmm. when I'm just in the air. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on the ground, how can I use this tool to ground myself, even if I'm not sure the outcome of it? I love this. Okay, great question. I want you to take out a notebook and you're going to write down any okay. single thing that makes you nervous. Could be anything. I mean, what? give me a couple. Oh There's a long list probably, but uh, off the top of my head, like something that, I don't know, I really wish that I could beat the fear on is I recently moved, um, not that far, but there's a really nice yoga studio on my street that I like pass every day. And I just always think like, I need to be a part of a community of 20 somethings that are like-minded that, you know, I just, I've always loved yoga. I've loved the community it brings, um, but I cannot bring myself to sign up and I can't bring myself up. Like I just constantly think about the day I have to show up for my first class and it makes me way too anxious to even like, go. This is an excellent example. And by the way, incredibly common and very relatable. Yeah. So I'm really glad you shared it. So you're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to create a confidence anchor. Because what I hear is I hear you want to do it. I hear mm -hmm. it pulling you and the nerves are keeping you back. So name the name something you're excited about. So like, can you pick like a coffee shop in your neighborhood that you love to go to and it's going to be your treat to get a nice latte when you're done? Yep. Do you yeah. want me to name it? Yeah, I do. It's called Thinking Cup. I love Thinking Cup. Now <laughs> you're going to close your eyes. What okay. color yoga tights are you wearing? Oh God. Maybe like, I have this really nice light blue ones that I always like to wear. I love it. And as a treat, because you went to this relaxing yoga class in your light blue tights, sweatshirt tied around your waist, yoga bag over your shoulder, standing at Thinking Cup. What did you order? Um, Probably like an iced oat milk latte. Love it. <laughs> love it. How do you feel? Yeah. As you're walking out of the thinking cup, having just completed that class and treating yourself to that, how do you feel right now? Like proud of myself for doing it. Awesome. There's your confidence anchor. Anytime you feel nervous, you're going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, to interrupt the nerves and create that starting ritual. And you're going to drop that confidence anchor. 
And what's going to happen is it's going to slowly retrain your mind that you're not nervous about joining that yoga studio. You're actually excited. And when you start to practice this confidence anchor, at some point you're going to find yourself walking down the street and there's the studio. And as that wave, because remember, it's automatic. That automatic response comes up because you're about to do something new. You get to choose whether your brain says no or yes. And using the confidence anchor in this research from Harvard in the five-second rule, you can flip that moment from one of stress to one that's something awesome because you have the power to make your brain say yes. Why does the high fat, uh, high, the, the high five habit even like work? Were you first of all doing it when you were in a bad place and you were high fiving yes. yourself? Yeah. So this is what happened. Okay. So, so, um, I invented the five second rule, for example, right. when, uh, my husband's restaurant business was going under, I was unemployed. We were nearly a million dollars in debt and we were about to lose everything. Three kids under the age of 10 liens on the house, no money in the bank. Um, just deeply, deeply terrifying moment. I, I couldn't get out of bed uh, without hitting the snooze button four or five times and the kids missing the bus. I literally became a person I did not recognize, drinking myself into the ground, screaming at my husband all the time, constantly on edge, panic stricken, the whole thing. And I invented the five second rule out of dumb luck as a trick to help me get out of bed. The idea being if I launched myself out of bed, maybe I wouldn't be in bed when the anxiety hit that I could move fast enough to beat the depression, the overwhelm, the fear, and the anxiety. And it worked. And that's spread around the world. It's changing millions of people's lives. It's super cool. And the high five habit was born out of very similar experience. So the book is not a pandemic book, but I developed the high five habit or stumbled upon it rather on a really low morning. That's it. Like, you know, the kids are home. College is imploded. We're in full-blown pandemic mode. My daytime talk show's canceled, so I've been fired from my dream job. I've had a book contract canceled because I haven't turned in the book on time. I start having speeches canceled, so now I'm getting triggered feeling the financial freefall that we had experienced a decade ago. And I was just overwhelmed. My kids are in breakdown. I'm in breakdown. The world is in breakdown. And I get up one morning and I walk into my bathroom and I'm standing there in front of the sink in my underwear. And I'm brushing my teeth and just sort of on autopilot, not really thinking about anything. And I catch my reflection in the mirror. And I know every woman in particular will relate to this moment. And I know every dude does too. But I see myself and I think, God, you look like hell. <laughs> yes, I think everyone can relate to that. You know, and then I start picking myself apart because a negative thought is a lot like Lynn. Once it mm -hmm. gathers, it gathers more and more and more. And so I um, literally start going, your boobs one size bigger than the other, your gray hair's coming in, your lines on your neck, the bags on your, like just, and then of course I'm like, oh my gosh, I got up late and I've got a Zoom call in eight minutes and I haven't even walked the dog yet. And I just felt beaten down. And I was doing it to myself. I mean, yeah. my thoughts were just like killing me. And I, I, I had nothing to say. And I don't know what the hell came over me. I mean, it is the cheesiest thing in the world. But there I am in my underwear without a bra on or even a cup of coffee. And I find myself like raising my hand and high-fiving myself in the mirror. And that very first high-five, it's, it's not like it changed my life. Right, right. But... What happened is something flipped in me. I, I went from this nasty, negative, just damaging self-talk to silence and to feeling like, okay, I know it's hard. I got this. Come on, get back out there. And my shoulders went back and I went off on my day. And here's when I knew something was up because the next morning I woke up and I got out of bed and I always make my bed right after I get up. And I immediately thought about seeing myself in the mirror. Now, I have probably for the last 45 years either criticized myself or ignored myself in the mirror. I have never looked forward to seeing myself in the mirror. It's sort of like that feeling like if you're going to go meet a friend for a cup of coffee and you're walking up to the cafe and you've got this feeling of excitement that you're about to see somebody that you like. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. And so I, you know, like I walk into the bathroom and there's my reflection. 
And so I had this moment with myself on the second morning, morning mm -hmm. where I'm standing there with myself. I'm not criticizing myself. I'm just being with myself. And then I start thinking about the day ahead and how I want to show up. And I raise my hand again. Now, here's the crazy thing when you try it, because I'm on a mission to make everybody on the planet try this thing. You have a challenge actually going on. Yes, today, don't you? it's called the High Five Challenge. We're getting 5 million people to wake up five mornings in a row and start their day with a high five in the mirror, setting an intention, journaling on it, uh, using this simple practice to change the neural pathways in your mind and reset the default programming you have about yourself. It's powerful stuff. Yeah. So, so here's what's crazy about it. So first of all, when you stand there and you do it, so here's how you do it. You walk into the bathroom, pair it with brushing your teeth because hopefully everybody's doing that in the morning. Uh, well, let's hope. Yes. Right? And we're going to have it stack. Yeah. So you're going to either do it before the brushing of the teeth or after the brushing of the teeth. And you're going to just take a moment and you're going to be with yourself. That's it. You're just going to look at yourself in the eyes in the mirror. I want you to think about the day ahead. I want you to think about what game you're playing in life. And that's it. Who are you going to be today? How do you want to show up? And then you're going to raise your hand and you're going to high five yourself. Now, here's the first thing you're going to notice. First of all, you're going to notice whether or not you quickly do it and are like, why haven't I been doing this before? Or you're going to notice that you're super resistant to it. And this is what most people feel. That's what I, I mean, I tried it because, you know, I've been reading your book and I, I felt weird and strange. Yeah. Well, know? here's why. You've never been taught to celebrate yourself. If you're a woman, you've been told that you're a bitch or you're selfish or you are conceited if you do it. To be a good girl, a good friend, a good wife, a good this, a good partner, you're supposed to support everybody else. Yeah. You have been actually taught to withhold it from yourself, to give it to yourself last. And so, yeah, it is uncomfortable for most of us. There's an even sadder reason why. And the sadder reason why is you have a story about your past that you're not worthy of it. You have evidence in your mind that you are a piece of shit, or that you are worthless, or that you're a bad person, or that you're unlovable. You look at all the things that you think that you've done wrong, and you think it makes you unworthy of that kind of support and celebration. That's why you look outside yourself for it, for validation and relationships, mm -hmm. from likes, from the amount of money you have, the kind of car that you drive. You have to start to figure out how to build the self-worth and the self-love and the self-validation within yourself. The other reason why it is very difficult for people to do this is because you have been trained to believe that if you're not achieving or doing something worthy of celebration, you don't deserve it. Mm, and yeah. I'm here to say bullshit. If you wake up in the morning and you can stand in front of that mirror and you're still breathing, you deserve and need encouragement and support. You have survived so much stuff and here you are still standing up, trying a little harder. Are you kidding me? What's interesting is also like, and, and you uh, talks about this a bit in your book, the amount of evidence for it, right? So the fa talk about what neuro, is it called neurobics? Yeah, isn't a weird word? Yeah, I didn't I, make that up. I was it's thinking really aerobics, weird. neurobics, and, this, and about how it's true when you do that with children, there's a whole thing about like how children respond to high fiving. Well, well, first of all, think about what's going viral right now. We're taping this at the beginning of the school year, at least right. here in the United States. You see all these teachers holding up mirrors, I'm this, affirmations. That's true. You see all these teachers mm -hmm. high fiving individual handshakes. Yep. Why do we love that? It's so true. Because it makes people feel good and positive. And it makes you realize each one of those kids feels seen. Mm -hmm. That's why they had the mirror so they can see themselves. Correct. I saw I that. That was such a great piece. I Yeah. Yeah. And so here's the other thing I want to say. It is actually, it's, it'll feel weird, but you won't think this is weird. Right. And here's why. So you've spent your entire life high-fiving other people. Right. When you give or receive a high-five, what is that? Met, what does that physical gesture communicate to somebody? That they, that they achieve, that they did well, that you're, you know, that, uh, that they are good, they're great, they're whatever it is, like all the positive. I believe in F. you. Let's go. Yeah. We got this. I got your back. I celebrate right. you. Support. I support. It's keep support. Going. It's yes. support. And love and so like all of it. Yeah. So you've been doing that for everybody else your whole life and you've done it with this motion. So it's already programmed mm -hmm. in your subconscious mind with this motion. So when you go and stand in front of the mirror and your default is to criticize yourself, the second you raise your hand for a high five, the subconscious mm -hmm. part of your brain takes over and it marries that programming. I believe in you. I love you. I celebrate you. You got this with your own reflection. 
it changes how you see yourself. And I like, I love how that again, about the kids thing, cause I have kids, Yeah, you have kids. First that, day of school was yesterday. Right. So, yeah. my, oh, for mine was a couple of weeks ago. But the fact is like, I like to use that now. I, now I, I do that with my kids all the time, but now I'm going to be much more conscientious of doing it even more yeah. versus just good job. Because so let me explain the study. Yeah. So, so they did this study where, you know, because of course what happened is I start doing this in my own life. I'm feeling crazy benefits. I post one photo on my story within an hour or two, a hundred or so people have tagged me and they're doing it. I'm like, okay, there's something going on here. That's when I dig into the research. Mm, That's okay. when I go, whether this is a thing or not a thing, I want to understand why this is working for me because you can't raise your hand and think I suck. Right. Because your brain won't allow it because of the programming associated with the physical movement. So that's the neurobics part of it. Correct. Yeah. And then the second piece is with the study, they took kids and they wanted to know what's the best way to motivate kids through a very challenging problem or like that they have to work through. Mm -hmm. And so the first group of kids get the classic fixed mindset verbal praise. Hey, you're really smart. You're really talented. You're really good looking like a fixed trait. That's not very motivating. We know that for decades mm -hmm. of research. The second group get verbal praise in the form of a growth mindset, which we know is more motivating mm -hmm. the traits. You're praising the effort. You talk about it all the time on the show. Praising, oh, great job, keep going, love your perseverance, really hard work. You're praising something the kids can control, which is how much effort they put mm -hmm. in, more motivating than just saying you're smart. The third group gets a simple high five from the researcher. No words at all. Just walk up, high five, walk away. That group outperforms the other ones. Just, I don't even know if it was tenfold, twentyfold, it doesn't even matter. It was so profound that the researchers, when they published the study in an academic journal, called it the motivating power of a high five. Why? The reason why a simple high five is way more powerful than any kind of verbal praise or mantra that you could have is because a high five fulfills your most foundational emotional needs. When you receive a high five, you feel seen. Mm. And I'm going to tell you something about it. Like, if you ever get a crappy high five where you like kind of miss a hand, what do you do? You've got to you do, do it again. again. You got to do it again. You because it creates, yeah. you have to be intentional about it. There's an intention behind it. So you do yeah. feel seen when you get one. You also feel heard. If you get a high five from somebody when you're going through a challenging time and they high five you to try to lift your spirit up, you feel like somebody gets it. you're down. Mm -hmm. You, you know, the, the mm -hmm. kids knew, these researchers knew that this was hard. You feel understood. Yes. yes. And then you feel celebrated mm. for the unique you that you are. And I'm here to tell you, you can build that relationship with yourself. Those researchers were sharing in the struggle with those kids and were cheering them on. And I'm telling you, practicing the high five habit and the tools in this book you can absolutely build that partnership with yourself. So the high five is for personal uh, self-assuredness or confidence. Mm -hmm. The hand to the heart is more for anxiety. Yeah, right? it's for it's for basically calming, calming down your nervous system. Right. Exactly. And then, so how about with the negative thoughts and all that? What is there uh -huh. like, can you use the high five for the negative yeah, so or the five, four, five, four, three, two, correct. one? Correct. So that's a way to flip yourself from a negative mindset to a high five attitude. Okay. So it's the five, four, three, two, one for that. Yeah, And I'm not thinking about that. And I'm not thinking about that. And that you said works too, because it's oh, changing yeah. all that. Absolutely. Then um, how about the mantras? I wanted to ask you about this because okay. people always talk about have a mantra, you know, whatever that you say. For me, it never seems to do a, a damn thing. And I think a lot of people would agree. But you talk about having, basically creating a, what was it, like a like a meaningful mantra right. that actually works. Right. So how do you do that? What's the difference? Oh, there's a big difference. So kind of if you hate your body. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter that really struggles uh, with how she looks right now. How old is she? Uh, 22. 22. She's, she's, yeah. she's the one with the text in the book who oh, sent I, yes. me the text seriously while I was writing the book that said, why do I always... Why am I always the ugliest one at the bar? I saw that text. It was very, very hard to, I, I, it broke my heart when I saw that. Yeah. As a mom, especially, it's yeah. tough to see and, that. And the whole point, and she, I have her permission to talk about it. And I had her permission to write about it. You know, the text shows that when you get something like that from somebody that you love, it's interesting because that text reveals how she sees the world. Mm -hmm. 
not how we see her in the world. Right. And it's really important to understand that your experience in life is 1000% determined by what filter you're viewing the world mm -hmm. through. And yes, you may have all kinds of evidence that you're overweight right now, or you've let your health go, or that you've done some things that you regret. But how does beating yourself up over it help you change those things? It doesn't. Right. In fact, based on the research, we know that being hard on yourself makes it even less likely you're going to change. It's very demotivating that the most empowering force on the planet is feeling supported and encouraged. And most people who are in a place where they have something that they don't like about their life or their bank account or their pant size or themselves, they spend all day harping on themselves about it instead of flipping it into encouraging and focusing on what they want. So in terms of meaningful mantras, there is no way in hell my daughter in where she is in her life is going to stand in front of a mirror and go, I love my body. Should she? Of course she should. Is she the ugliest person in the bar? Are you kidding me? I, I've tried everything. I, I, I follow the experts in this area. I don't ever talk about her body. I talk about her personality, her loyalty, what an incredible mm -hmm. friend and daughter and human, her sense of humor, her work, like all of it. She is so focused on how miserable she feels about it that her brain in real time filters the world mm -hmm. in a way to go, oh, see that person scanner to me, boom, more evidence. Completely ignoring that every all the other people that she'd actually not be bigger than, your brain will literally reorganize itself in real time mm -hmm. in order to confirm what you believe and what you keep telling yourself. And so the back to the mantras, if you don't believe it, your mind rejects it, seriously. And so you have to start with something that I call meaningful. I probably should have called it pathetic mantras <laughs> in order to make it stick because it's not something like, let's say that you think you're a bad person, okay? You got cheating in your past or maybe you were abused. You've got childhood trauma. You got all kinds of evidence from your past that makes you stand in front of the mirror and see somebody that does not deserve a have five because you're a damaged person that screws everything up, okay? Mm -hmm. What happens when you start to tell yourself that? Maybe somebody told you that when you were growing up. You've thought it so often. You now think it all the time. Just because you've thought it for a long time doesn't mean it has to stay as the default in your mind. That's the other thing that people don't realize is that at any moment in time, you can get intentional about resetting the default shit that you think in your mind. Just because you're used to it doesn't mean you have to keep thinking it. So if, if you get in front of that mirror, oh, let me just keep going with this, this story. So if you have this opinion that your damaged goods and everything that you do screws up and you're a bad person, let's take a really innocuous example. Let's say that you um, are not good enough. I think it's more about being not good enough. Oh, I think people's stories. I think that's the thing people say in public. I think that's a nice mm. way to say, I think I'm a piece of shit. I think I'm worthless. I think I'm not good enough. Sounds okay in polite conversation. You don't think that social media though has played such a mind, like such a screw up in people's minds because they're comparing constantly to other people. Yeah, but you know, look, Social media is a tool. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Too many people have allowed themselves to become the tool. And mm -hmm. if you have an issue or a problem with comparison, stop being an asshole about social media to mm -hmm. yourself. Go through your feed and get rid of every single account that triggers you. Mm -hmm. And fill your account with things that actually make you feel good about yourself, that are about where you're going instead of where you're not and where you're lacking. By doing that and, and, and curating your own feed to make you feel like shit, you are tripling down on the programming in your brain and making your brain believe, oh, it's important that I feel bad. It's important I see people skinnier than me. It's important that I see people that have more money than me. It's important that I see all these fake relationships online. It's important that I sit here in bed and before I even set my intention or do my morning routine, I spend 30 minutes self-loathing as I look at people's vacations and I make myself wrong about where I'm not. What the fuck are you doing? Seriously, get rid of those accounts on your feed. 
If you're unhappy, do something about it. Mm -hmm. And the fastest way to use social media for good is delete all the crap that makes you feel like horrible about yourself and start putting in things that reinforce the message that you are in control of your life. You can change your life. You can achieve your goals. You can be a happier person. You can heal your trauma. Absolutely. That is a thousand percent in your control. You shouldn't be a robot about it. And so, and but you know, nobody does. We all just kind of mindlessly consume it because that's right. how it's designed. But it can be an incredibly powerful tool for good if you're intentional about how you use right. it. Right. The curation is actually a very good idea, but people don't take that extra step to do that. You have to. Like yeah. unfollow Friday. Unfollow Friday. Every Friday, go through your feed and unfollow people. That's a great idea. Yeah. And if you're like, oh, but my Uncle Joe is going to get annoyed if I'm mute him. Who gives a shit what your Uncle Joe thinks? Honest to God, like your social media is for you. Stop thinking about what you're broadcasting on social media and start thinking about what you're allowing into your mind. That's a great one. Look at the last five people you texted. Are those people helping you get where you want to go? Are you asking me or just? Or, I'm oh, just oh, okay. saying there's a <laughs> test you sure. can do. Look at yeah. the last five people you texted. Look at the last five accounts you liked. Oh, Kim Kardashian, thanks a lot. Like she's an amazing businesswoman. Amazing businesswoman. Is she actually helping you get where you want to go? Absolutely. I don't follow her, but I, I would imagine not. Yes. Well, I don't know. For yeah. some people, maybe. For some people, not. Like get serious about your life. Mm -hmm. Like at some point, you're going to die. At some point, this whole thing's over. And you're mindlessly walking through this and setting up your whole life to make you feel like shit. And you don't have to. That's the reason, by the way, why you can't stand in front of a mirror and high five yourself because your whole life has been organized uh, around making you feel bad about yourself. And I'm here to tell you, you can turn this around. You can change your social media fees. That's number one. Number two, you can force yourself to try this stupid thing. Try it for five days. Mm -hmm. Do the high five challenge. Just go to high five challenge. Dot com. You can sign up for free. It's super easy. High five yourself in the mirror for five days in a row and see what happens. We have a woman who had body dysmorphia for 20 years write to us and say she hasn't looked at herself in 20 years. Five days of doing this, she can now look at herself and grin because she doesn't see her body anymore. She sees the human being inside. Wow. Yeah, we have a woman that wrote to us in a domestic violence shelter saying that, you know, she had just escaped this abusive relationship. She's lost everything. She has so much trauma. But this high five thing has made her realize she still has herself. Wow. She can have her own back. And it begins every single morning rebuilding that partnership with yourself. You know, there's only one person that you spend your whole life with. That's right. And it's high time you start working on improving the relationship that you have with yourself because it is the foundation of every relationship that you have. If you feel like shit about yourself, you will allow people into your life who treat you like shit. If you start to empower, encourage, and support yourself, you will build up your self-esteem and worthiness so that you are strong enough to attract and be around the people that you deserve and that deserve you. And I'm not saying that anybody deserves abuse. That's not what I'm saying at all. So do not take that out of context. I'm not saying to you, but I'm right, right, right. Uh, what I'm saying is you're not responsible for any of the bad shit that's happened to you. You survived it. You are responsible for what happens next. And that's where building a relationship with yourself matters. People don't have boundaries because they can't even look themselves in the eye. So how the fuck are you going to look somebody else in the eye? Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. And that's, again, very tangible stuff. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.